Okay, so let's start off with uh, districts two, three, and four are up for supervisors this year. So if the members of district two would, and, and the candidates in district two would stand and announce themselves, it would be appreciated so everyone knows who we are. I'm in. <laughs> and you are? My name is Kevin Heroff. Uh, nice I actually live uh, down to Francis Drake off of here in Green so I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Great. District, District 3. we got a bunch of you. I'm Kate Sears. Uh, currently, you're the county supervisor for District 3. And I'm Susan Kirsch. I'm from Mill Valley, and I'm the challenger. <laughs> My name is Brian Staley. I live in Woodacre. Um, Thank you, Brian. Yeah. One, of, one of eight, I believe. Nine. Nine today. Nine. I'm Alex Easton Brown. I live in Lagunitas. I came here in 68, the summer of love, and never left. And uh, trying to make bring how it was when I first came, was, I think it's possible. Yay, yay. My name is Mary Tamburo, and I Live in Homestead Valley. My name is Wendy Kellens, and I live in Forest Hill. My name is Dominic Rossi. I'm a rancher in Nevada. <coughs> Great, thank you all. A <laughs> little louder. Yeah. So to get started, and my apologies for the no PA system. They had a speaker here. They had everything. We got here tonight. And he says, "Oh, that's gone." Great. So. You'll have to speak louder probably when you're up here, but it, it's a fairly small group, so hopefully it shouldn't be too much of a, of a burden. Um, we're going to start with District 2. So we had uh, this one. <laughs> That's right, Kevin. So I'm going to turn it over to Kevin and you know hold your questions until the end, and then we'll do a Q&A with all of them up here. Well, thank you for that introduction. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be here. Again, my name is Kevin Heroff, uh, and I'm a candidate for the District 2 seat on the Board of Supervisors. Um, I, I really am very grateful to be here tonight. This is actually the first opportunity that I've had to, to, to go to an event like this, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here. So thank you. Um, I got into the District 2 race. Speak up. Speak up. <coughs> okay, I'm doing my best. I got into the District 2 race last year uh, because of concerns that I share with, I'm sure, many in this room over the unprecedented pressure that Marin County is facing to accommodate regional growth and development. Too often, the response to those pressures has been through the promotion <coughs> of increasing levels of urbanization throughout the county, but most particularly along the 101 corridor between Sausalito and San Rafael. This has resulted in levels of traffic congestion that keep getting worse, threats to the integrity of our local water supply, and continuing assaults on Marin's visual and natural environment. Anyone who's driven down that corridor can look over and see the most prominent assault on the visual environment of this community, Wind Cup. That's the most glaring example of this trend toward urbanization um, in this community, but it's certainly not the only one. In 2014, as a newly elected member of the Larkspur City Council, I had the opportunity to help stop a massive development plan at Larkspur Landing. That was the so-called Larkspur Landing Station Area Plan, which would have allowed development of the equivalent of five or more wind cups. It was not just me who helped shut that plan down. Many members of the public, including many people here in this room, were instrumental in bringing about that outcome. But my voice on the environmental issues raised by the station area plan played a part and prompted me to take my own voice beyond just the city of Larkspur. More than ever, we need a voice that will push back against the influence of regional agencies and developers that support them. I'm an environmental lawyer and a small business owner. I know I can be that voice. 
and I can bring a new focus on transparency and openness in Marin County's government. I have a deep affection for our county's distinctive character and quality of life. I have lived in Marin for 30 years. My wife and I have raised three children here, and all of them have attended Marin Public Schools. On a professional level, I've worked as an environmental attorney in private practice for nearly 35 years, primarily in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. In addition to businesses and individuals, I have represented large public agencies like the Santa Clara Valley Water District and the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. I know how government works and how it sometimes does not work. We face a range of problems in our community that have not been effectively addressed and that require new leadership in District 2. First and foremost is traffic, particularly along the Sir Francis Strait corridor between Ross and 101. I am appalled at the way in which this issue has been dealt with in the last 10 years. Nothing concrete has been accomplished to address this problem. Despite the voters' approval of a one-half cent sales tax 10 years ago, Measure A, that by law must be focused specifically on alleviating traffic congestion. Instead of dealing with traffic congestion, county planners want to worsen it with so-called traffic calming measures and the addition of new bike lanes for which there is no real demand. The county wants to divert Measure A funds to build bicycle pathways, bridges, and tunnels, even though their own data shows that bike community commuting has actually declined. Millions of dollars have already been spent on bicycle infrastructure in Marin County. None of this has had any genuine effect on traffic. That is not how the voters wanted to spend our tax dollars. I believe we should spend Measure A funds only on programs proven, proven to alleviate traffic congestion. If we are adding lanes to Sir Francis Drake, they should be car lanes, not bike lanes that would benefit less than 1% of the total users of Sir Francis Drake on any given day. The single most important thing that we can do to alleviate traffic congestion on Sir Francis Drake is to invest in smart, adaptive traffic signal technology. That could be done today. Yet the county refuses to pursue that, preferring to wait until their plans to reconfigure our roads and streets are further developing, further developed. <coughs> They say that development will not add to congestion and that the smart train will solve all our problems. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Continuing the county's pro-development policies will only further compromise the quality of life in our community. As supervisor, I will do everything I can to reverse that trend and promote more common sense strategies to meet our local housing needs. I want to emphasize that everything I plan to do as supervisor, and I plan to be a supervisor, will be guided by principles of government, transparency, and protection of our unique Marin County environment, including an unequivocal ban on the use of glyphosate in public open spaces and parks. I will commit to full compliance with the requirements of the Brown Act, our state government's sunshine law. It is a travesty that our current board has had to face lawsuits and court orders to enforce those requirements in the last year. That will change when I am elected. I also will commit to full compliance with the public comment and review process needed to address environmental issues under the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, and other state laws. Nothing is more important in Marin than the protection of our environment. And I will make sure that we accomplish that goal with the input and support of everyone in our community. The hidden agendas and ideologies of our current county leadership and the special interests at special interests that influence them are driving decisions that are destroying the quality of life in Marin. My opponents have decades of involvement with local government, working in a system that is broken and needs to be fixed. We need a new voice and new leadership to steer this county in the right direction. I am committed to being that new voice who will stand up to regional planners and special interests, protect the environment, and bring new and positive ideas to the table. With your support, we can say no to outside influences. We can address traffic congestion intelligently. We can reduce pension liabilities. And we can protect Marin's quality of life. Working together, we can create Marin solutions for Marin County. Thank you.
I'm Frank Ager from Fairfax. I've been a Marin resident since 1959. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself so you understand who I am, where I'm coming from, and where I'm going. I'm born and raised and Jesuit educated in San Francisco. I'm the son of a former decorated San Francisco police officer. I also hold a two-year degree in law enforcement from Santa Rosa Junior College. I have served folks in Marin on local, countywide, regional, state, and federal boards, commissions, and councils for four, over four decades. Some of our boards, commissions, and councils work well, and some don't. And one of the problems is the consultants. But I'll get into the consultants a little further down. I'm a seven-term mayor of Fairfax. I was California's first Prop 20 Coastal Commissioner. I'm a founding director of the Ross Valley Paramedic Authority. A member of the first City County Planning Council. We actually had a City County Planning Council here in Marin at one time. I'm a, I was a member of the original Marin Sonoma Highway 101 Corridor Committee. I'm currently a trustee serving on the Marin Sonoma Mosquito Vector Control District Board. I'm an elected director for the Ross Valley Sanitary District, dealing with uh, sewer issues here in the Ross Valley. <laughs> And I'm sure you've read about some of, those, some of those issues we've been dealing with. I'm a commissioner on the Central Marin Sanitation Agency. I'm a former federal director on the Golden Gate Recreational Travel Study Board of Control. And of course, I've worked with nonprofits all those four decades. I'm a co-founder of Friends of the Eel River. I'm president of the North Coast Rivers Alliance. I'm the Vice President of Pesticide Free Zone and a board member for Stop the Spray Marin. I served from 2008 to 2016 as the San Francisco Bay Area Coordinator to stop aerial pesticide spraying for the light brown apple moth. Experience matters and what I bring to this position is experience that's unrivaled by any candidate in any of the districts. Renita and I own Casadero Winery, one of Sonoma County's boutique wineries. What was called Winery Direct. We make it, we sell it, we deliver it. So I'm used to getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and heading for the vineyard. Or getting up at, at 6 in the morning and, and delivering wine to one of our, one of our, one of our restaurants or, or, or retail outlets. My, gran my grandfather put vineyards in a Casadero in the 20s. They used to travel from San Francisco on the SS Casadero, a ferry, came up here through Marin on the train, on up through Fairfax, out to West Marin, West Sonoma County, and on into Casadero. So our family has a history here in, in, in Marin County that dates back to the early 1900s. I've only been in this race a couple of weeks, but we've got a lot of endorsements in a short period of time. Folks are liking what we're saying. They're going to our website, frankager.com, to see the issues. And of course, what are the issues? Well, here in the second district, they're numerous. Growth and development. Now, we don't have to come, become San Jose North in order to provide affordable housing here in Marin. Fairfax has shown the way on affordable housing. And and if you look at Fairfax, it's one of those small towns that's kept its character. They talk about the third lane on the bridge. They've been working on that for about three years. They've got to decouple the eastbound third lane with the westbound whatever it's going to be, a bike lane or third driving lane. The chair of the Marin County Board of Supervisors, Steve Kinsey, holds a powerful position on the Marin, uh, I'm sorry, on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. And I believe he alone could probably uh, get that third lane done <laughs> if he had a mind to do that. So we're talking about pesticide use in Marin. It's an issue. It's an issue. My, my wife, Renita, is a breast cancer survivor, triple negative. We live on a little street in Fairfax, Metaway, 
31 houses and 14 breast cancers on that little street. That tells you there's something going on in our county that we don't, you know, that we need to find out about. So in Fairfax, as, as a mayor, I authored Fairfax's ban on the use of pesticides in the commons and a neighbor notification law. And the reason is, folks at Fairfax said, gee, what's going on here? What are they spraying? The ban has worked. It has worked. If you're driving through Fairfax, you'll notice some weeds in the street, and the weeds in the right away. But you know what? The weeds don't bother much. We try to get out there with a weed eater and volunteers do some weed pulling. But the fact is, you know, Fairfax folks are really concerned about their health and safety and their welfare. The taxes in Marin County. 58 counties, and we have the highest taxes in the county. I'm sorry, highest taxes in the state. We're in county. If you look at your tax rate, we, we, we're a pre-prop 13 uh, property. We bought a little house at Fairfax in 1963. We're still in the same little house. Um, and the, the, the base taxes are $1,900 a year, and the add-ons are almost $2,000 a year. Our taxes are almost $3,800 a year for a small house. And it's the add-ons that are killing us. I, I mentioned the Marin Sonoma Mosquito Vector Control District Board, and last year you may have voted on a proposal for a tax increase for the Mosquito District. It was going to be about $12 a year, and folks said, oh, it's not a lot of money, it's not a, not a big deal. But it was a 59% increase in the taxes. And the majority of that money, $2 million, was going to go to pay down the pensions because the Mosquito District belongs to, the, to, the, to, the, to MSERA, the Marin Retirement System. Um, the voters turned that, that tax increase down because they kind of caught on. Uh, it was a dis really a deceptive measure. It was really tough. But, uh, Another issue was, is, is, the, is the, the dollar amount. For those who live in either Larkspur or the Ross, rest of the Ross Valley, you look at your sewer tax. 743 in, in, in much of the Ross Valley. And, and Larkspur, is that, they're, where are they? they're, they're well over 900, getting close to $1,000. Know, we're under a cease and desist order from the regional, Bay Area Regional Water Quality Control Board because of previous sewer spills. So I became the president of that board in 2012, and we took, we took it seriously. We got in, and we have corrected all of what they call fours and fives of, of the problem areas. The spills have been reduced to almost nothing. We've spent about $30 million fixing pipes. What I want to do is go back to the Bay Area Regional Water Quality Control Board and show them what, what Ross Valley Sanitary District has done and try to get out from under this cease and desist order and try to get some relaxation in, 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 in the amount of dollars they think needs to be spent here in the Ross Valley in order to solve some of the sewer issues. We, li we live in, in, in a magnificent place. And it's, it's that way because the people who came before us who worked so hard to protect Marin and I'm not about to let it go. I'm not about to give up on Marin. You know, we can have our cake and eat it too. We've got to get a handle on our expenses. The consultants that the county hires. In fact, a Tuesday, the board is looking to add $150,000 in consultant fees to the current consultants who are working on the flood control issues. They've paid those consultants almost $8 million over nine, over nine years. And they've done nothing in the creeks. They haven't, they haven't fixed anything. $8 million and, 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 and there's still potential for flooding. So what I bring is, is just a bit of common sense to the position. I figure you elect folks for their vision and their ideas and their solutions. And that's, and that's, that's what I bring to any, any agency that I sit on, any agency board that I sit on. I don't need a consultant to tell me what's going to work and what's not going to work. You know, when you've been around long enough, you understand what's going on. I mean, there's some monster trees growing in the creek. Why don't we get in there and cut those trees out, out, of, the, out of the creek bed? You know, Fair, town of Fairfax, they, they, they built a, in addition to town hall back in 1974, and at that time I said, I said to the, uh, 
to, to the town's consulting engineer, we should build over the creek here. It's going to flood. That was Ben Albritton. Ben Albritton said, Frank, I'll guarantee you, you and I will never see that building flood in our lifetime. Well, it's flooded twice. Flooded in 82, flooded in 2005. You know, I'm no engineer, but just common sense told me that building was going to flood. Um, the kind of fixes. We've got to lift some buildings out of the floodplain. We've got to move some buildings. We've got to clean the creeks. I mean, there's so much that can be done without, without going after our children's playgrounds and ball fields. There are two detention, detention bases, Memorial Park and Lefty Gomez Field. Totally unnecessary. And, they, and even if, 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 if they were dug down 17 feet and detention basins were put in, they wouldn't solve the, 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 the flooding problem. Because the engineers have no, they have no institutional memory. They, they're, just, they're just working the numbers, you know, so many, uh, so many inches of rain, and it's gonna, a creek's going to hold this much capacity, and we have to do X, Y, and Z in order to reduce the flow. We flood from the top down. Some of our streets look like rivers. We're flooding not from the creek up, it's from the, from the top down. I remember in 2005, I had just left the mayor's job in Fairfax. And we were flooding. And so I'm out on Bolinas Road crossing park. And I was in water about this deep to get over to town hall so I could get the records out of the, out of the lower cabinets because I knew the creek was coming over the buildings. They said to me, hey, get out of here, get out of here. You know, <coughs> I said, no, I'm just going to get the records up. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll be fine. Um, we were flooding from the top down. It wasn't the creek overflow. It was, <laughs> it was the rains pouring down Bolinas Road, pouring down Park Road rocks and debris. Anyway, um, just a little common sense goes a long way in, in any of these positions, whether you're a mayor or a council member or a supervisor, and, and that's what I'm going to bring to this job. And I, I hope you go to our website, frankigger.com, see what I've been up to, see what we're going to do. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Thank you. I'm Susan Kirsch. I'm running for the position for the Board of Supervisors for District 3. Um, I want, just for those of you who might not know, District 3 includes Mill Valley, which has been my hometown for the last 36 years. It also includes the cities of Sausalito, Tiburon Belvedere, and the unincorporated areas of Tam El Monte, Marin City, and Strawberry. And what I've come to learn is those unincorporated areas are really important in terms of how they depend on representation from someone on the Board of Supervisors. Over the last two months, I've been out walking the precincts. I got an early start. I wanted to say hello to people and hear what's on their minds. And what I've learned are things that I've put into three categories to talk about tonight and then give you some examples of what I'm hearing. Um, and I've organized this into, into the first category is that uh, people are concerned that my opponent and the Board of Supervisors in general are operating behind closed doors and without transparency. Secondly, there's concern that our money is not being spent wisely. And third, there's a great concern for the disregard of citizen opinion and including citizen oversight. So let me just kind of go into a little detail and give you some of the examples about those things that if elected, I would be making changes on those items. You know, Kevin made reference to the fact that one of the events of the last year has been that our Board of Supervisors were found guilty of violating the Brown Act. It was a case brought against them by Community Venture Partners for not giving adequate notice so that there was a chance for the public to participate in, an ev in, in the, a discussion about the housing element. So it's kind of the, the worst that you can get in terms of violating the Brown Act. Our own Board of Supervisors was guilty of that kind of closed door operating. A second example that I put into this category of a lack of transparency and responsiveness comes from the people in the district who live in the unincorporated area of Strawberry. And if you've been reading the IJ or anything, you, can know, you, you probably are aware of two key things. That there's a proposal to take the quiet little seminary campus and transform it into a thousand student campus. A thousand student, 200 teachers, 300 new houses. We can only imagine what that's going to do to the traffic. 
And that gets coupled with another project, which is to do a rezoning of an office that's been an administrative building and change it to a medical office building, which is intended, which is anticipated to add another 1,200 trips a day. So that kind of impact on one small community seems just grossly unfair. A third example of this lack of transparency was rolled out back in, I think of it as starting in 2011, when Plan Bay Area was rolled out. Um, you know, a, a huge effort to reduce greenhouse gases based on the idea of building high-density housing near transportation and having elements of removing decision-making from we, the people, into regional agencies that get further and further away from us. So there's the issue of transparency. The second big concern is about how our money is being spent wastefully, and let me give you a couple of examples of that. In Marin County, we have, oh, we have 625 people who have retired with compensa compensation of $100,000 or more in their annual camp compensation in retirement. You know, if we look around, that, I mean, we're not even 100 people in this room, so imagine six times this number of people retiring, providing no goods, no services, no products for $100,000 a year. Not only are they retiring without much money, the cost of living is an automatic assurance to them. So just recently in the Marin IJ, we saw the story of how there was an automatic increase of 2 to 4 percent increasing our countywide liability for pensions that we're paying over $10 million a month in order to cover the retiree health or the retiree retirement costs. Like, we need to get a handle on that or we are all going to be facing a kind of bankruptcy. You know, last summer, because the economy was robust and the board had some additional, they had $10 million extra, you know what they did with it? They spent $6 million to give across the board raises to all the staff. You know, and we heard from Kevin, you know, just this myriad of problems with transportation and not being able to get transportation solved for all of the money, all of the ways in which there is gas tax and parcel tax and so many different agencies. You know, we need to get a handle on solving our transportation problems. The third area of concern that I hear coming up a lot is this idea of people wanting to have respect when they're going before the county supervisors and wanting to embrace this quality of their work being appreciated and taken into account. Um, one of these things, you know, where I too have come out very clearly, you know, in favor of a ban against gly glyphosate, you know, like Frank's wife, I too am a breast cancer survivor. It ties to many, many women in my neighborhood having gotten cancer at the same time for what seems like a really careless use of a known carcinogen. Another area that the Board of Supervisors have been ignoring uh, is the work of the civil grand jury. You know, here you have groups of people who dedicate almost a year of their life to doing a neutral, careful, investigative journalistic reporting or research and then reporting. Far too often, the Board of Super Supervisors kind of cavalierly dismisses incredible work on topics like homelessness or on the smart train or on wind cup or on, um, or on pensions and ways that we could curtail pe pensions, on juvenile hall. And, uh, so we need to do a better job of honoring and appreciating the work of the citizens groups like a civil grand jury or the group of people the people in Citizens for Sustainable Pension Plans, another group of reti mostly retirees, come together once a week to look at how can they, out of a sense of civic responsibility, be educating other people about the threat that we're under for the onslaught of pension, out of control pensions. So I'm running for the Board of Supervisors because my opponent and the Board, the uh, Board of Supervisors in general, isn't working for the welfare of the greatest number of citizens. My professional background includes having many years as a high school teacher, for 10 years as a college professor, for 10 years as the executive director of a nonprofit organization, 
and then as the sole proprietor for my own business and doing consulting. So there is a skill set that includes communication and problem solving and planning and budgeting that I bring to being elected to the Board of Supervisor. In my community leadership role, I am the founder of Friends of Mill Valley, which had the impact of sustaining a small town character for Mill Valley by putting a stop to the Miller Avenue Precise Plan. I'm the founder of Citizen Marin, which took the principles of our own town and rolled them out to be relevant and helpful for communities throughout the county. I'm the chair of the Marin Coalition, and the combination of these organizations means we have educated thousands of people about the kinds of issues going on in Marin County. That educational quality is a part of what I would continue as a, a member of the Board of Supervisors. We need a change in leadership in District 3, and I'm prepared and eager to step into that role. I will bring transparency, fiscal accountability, and citizen oversight to that job. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me here tonight. I was telling Tom earlier, I, I grew up in a divided household. My mother was a Democrat and my father was a Republican, which makes me either incredibly nonpartisan or my parents just canceled each other out in the political realm all the time that I was growing up. I want to start by telling you a little bit about me. My name is Kate Sears, as I, as I think you know, and I really am a daughter of Southern Marin. I was born in San Francisco. My family moved to Mill Valley in 1955. It's sort of frightening to be able to say that that was 60 years ago. It makes me feel so, not so young anymore. So we moved to Mill Valley in 1955, and then we moved to Sausalito in 1965, and I graduated from Tam High in the class of 1969. I've been around a long time in this county. I'm really, I grew up with the, val the values of Marin County. I've seen a lot of change, and I've seen a lot of things that have stayed the same, particularly in terms of our values and our commitment to our community. I spent 22 years as a practicing lawyer before I, I got onto the board of supervisors. Um, 16 of those years were, were with a very large law firm, and about six of those years were with the California Attorney General's Office in the Consumer Law Section in San Francisco. And that was, I really had a lot of fun in that, in that particular position. I was the lead lawyer in the first lawsuit filed against Countrywide Bank for predatory lending. I investigated the rating agencies. I went after all those bad actors that were making life very difficult and very unfair and really ripping off all of us as consumers. So I also have served on uh, the Sausalito Planning Commission for five and a half years, which is really, as if any of you in this room have served on a planning commission, is a great training ground uh, for public service and, and other kinds of positions. I also, in Sausalito, chaired a couple of citywide resident task forces dealing with particular challenges facing Sausalito. Uh, one of those, these, these were task forces where, as the chair, I really brought together people with divergent views on issues and worked to find common ground and find solutions. One of the examples of uh, one of those groups and what we accomplished is the public safety buildings that you see in Sausalito, the fire and police stations that you see in Sausalito came out of that process. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. It was a year-long process, and at that point I thought I was going to retire from public life uh, until I forgot about it and um, applied for my current position um, uh, following the untimely and very young death of my predecessor, Charles McGlashan. I was appointed uh, by the governor, Jerry Brown, uh, to replace Charles McGlashan in June of 2011. I had worked for the governor when he was the attorney general prior to becoming governor, so he, uh, we knew each other well. I then was elected to office in 2012, and here I am today. And I, I guess if I would sort of describe myself and my values and what I really try to bring to my work as your supervisor, it's really working together and finding common ground. And I want to go through some of the issues. Uh, I'll go through them fairly quickly because I know we have a, uh, a question and answer period coming up. But I want to tell you about some of the issues that I really uh, spend a lot of time working on uh, as the supervisor for Southern Marin. And the first of those is ones that all of us are very familiar with. Anybody who drove, tried to drive here tonight knows about traffic. Traffic and infrastructure These are significant issues for our county as all of us know. And there's no, unfortunately, quick fix 
to our traffic problems in particular. What we really need to do, and what I've been trying to do, is to take a more holistic approach and a very collaborative approach to addressing our traffic challenges. And I just want to give you a couple examples. So working with uh, the county, obviously, with our county staff, with the city of Mill Valley, with the town of Tiburon, we stopped Caltrans from installing yet another traffic light at North Knoll Road in t on Tiburon Boulevard in Strawberry, which have, would have just made the traffic there even worse. We convinced Caltrans not to do that and to try common sense approaches instead. We've also been working collaboratively with Caltrans uh, and the city of Mill Valley to address traffic congestion in Tam Valley. That's kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Um, but we have implemented a variety of measures there. We keep working on it to try to address the, the congestion there caused by our visitors as well as all of us in our cars. We're continuing to work with the city of Mill Valley to come up with short and long-term solutions to our, our traffic congestion issues at East Blythdale and the 101 interchange. We're partnering with Mill Valley, City of Mill Valley and the Mill Valley School District. The county is to really launch, to fund and collaborate in launching a yellow school bus pilot project that's really focused at taking the folks off the road who are taking their child to school, driving alone with their child in a car and crossing that overpass over 101 between East Blythdale and Tiburon Boulevard. I'm excited about that and it really We've tried to learn lessons from Tiburon's yellow school bus project that they started last year that had an incredible impact in reducing traffic on the Tiburon uh, Peninsula and we're also supporting Tiburon in keeping that program, that yellow bus program going. With the help of some people in this room, uh, we really were able to reach a breakthrough agreement with the National Park Service to try to deal with the traffic problems, the impact in Tam Valley Shoreline Highway caused by our heavy visitation to Muir Woods. And that took a long time to get there, but we did. This spring, you'll hear that we're expanding Marin Transit bus service by 17% um, to try to encourage people to get out of their cars and make our public transit more convenient. We've also spent a lot of time uh, and a lot of effort and a lot of attention expanding our safe routes to school networks and our bike pet pathways. And, you know, last, yesterday evening I spent a couple, number of hours with about 50 young high-tech entrepreneurs. And although some of us might think that commuting to work on a bike sounds implausible, it's certainly not something that I think I've got the skill to do, there were a number of these young tech entrepreneurs who were saying, we, we want, we need better ways to commute by bicycle, and our employees consider that a priority. So it's something we, mu we need to make sure does not slip off of our radar. On the infrastructure piece, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of bridges, a lot of roadway in the county. And this is a very high priority for me and for our, our board of supervisors. We've increased the amount of money that we spend on improving our road quality, from uh, our surface quality from five million a year to eight million a year. That's nowhere enough. We need to find $15 million a year just to maintain the road quality that we have currently. This is a huge challenge. And it takes working with our state representatives finding more Republican votes in the state legislature to really get a good transportation plan passed that will provide funding for all of our communities, our cities and towns and our county to try to deal with our road infrastructure um, issues. So that's one issue. The second issue that's very important in Southern Marin that you heard about a moment ago is the Golden Gate Baptist Seminary property in Strawberry. That's a fantastic property. And uh, I think, I feel very strongly that anything that may ultimately happen on that property needs to be right-sized, it needs to minimize our traffic impacts, and it needs to be in harmony with the community. Another area that, are, that I've spent a lot of time and will continue to spend a lot of time uh, working on is sea level rise and climate change. For those of you who know me well, you know I can talk about this for a very long time, and so I'm going to try hard not to do that. But, um, you know, Southern Marin, other parts of our county as well, already are feeling the effects of sea level rise and flooding. If you take Manzanita, Pahono, and Southern Marin and the on-ramp, the, uh, from the exit ramp from 101 into Marin City, these are areas that where we are feeling effects. I'm working closely with Caltrans to kind of try to come up with very common sense solutions to address some of those issues. I've also been working to make sure that we have grassroots engagement 
in dealing with climate change and planning for climate change and planning for how we address sea level rise. This has to be solutions we come up with have to be ideas that all of us feel are appropriate for our communities. Through marine, marine clean energy, I'm also working to expand our renewable energy options and to really expand our energy efficiency opportunities because while we're thinking about adaptation for sea level rise, all of us need to be doing better on, on mitigation and cutting down on the amount of greenhouse gases that we personally create. Another area that I'm very engaged in sort of relates probably to most of us in this room, and that is our aging community. Um, I am our board liaison for our active aging initiative through our county health and human services that brings together a fantastic collaboration of organizations around the county to really address the needs of our aging community. You know, the boomer generation is retiring. Uh, we have a lot of needs, and I think in a lot of ways we need to rethink what it means to be aging and what the needs are. We need to make sure that we have active, healthy, and engaged com senior community while we also have a very strong safety net for those who are most in need. The other sort of category uh, of issues that I pay a lot of attention to is sort of all things generally related to safety. If you remember back in September, we had 556 fires burning around the, the state of California um, coming out of our drought. It was great when we got rain. We're not at all convinced that we're out of that drought situation. And fire safety is hugely important for all of us given our geography. We need to make sure that we have, we're all prepared, we have the emergency response, we have the ability to both get out of our communities in a fire and feel safe, and we have the staff that we need to make sure that we are safe. I mentioned bike, pet, and pedestrian. Pedestrian safety is something we need to pay attention to in all of our communities. I live in Sausalito. Where I live, you know, there's no sidewalks. That's true of a lot of the areas, a lot of our communities. We need to find the funds, which is a challenge, to close those gaps uh, for our pedestrian safety and our bike safety. And I'd like to take the idea of safe routes to school and expand that into safe routes to seniors. We need to make sure that all of us can get around our community safely. The final category of issues that, I, that is very important for all of us is uh, really open communication and responsible government. Our county has reduced our retiree, li our retiree liabilities by 233 million in the last three years. This is an issue that we're paying close attention to and we're trying to manage responsibly. We've also improved our budget process by adopting a two-year budget for the first time and that's a benefit because it gives you a larger, a longer planning horizon and I think it's provided some really good discipline for our county departments. And the, uh, and the other aspect of that, of course, is communication. For those of you who may be signed up for my electronic newsletters, you know that I communicate. My District 3, my office communicates all the time. We want to make sure that people in Southern Marin and whoever wants to sign up for my newsletters is aware of what's going on at the county. We can always do better. This is the endless challenge of trying to make sure that people are hearing about what is going on and having a chance uh, to communicate with us and to, pro to provide input. The wonderful thing about being in local government, whether you're at the, at the city or town level, at the county level, is that you really do have a close relationship with your residents and we have that opportunity to really communicate uh, and I believe me, people send me suggestions all the time and that's what makes it worthwhile. You want to hear what people are thinking and you want to see tangible results in your community. So I look forward to everybody's questions. I'll just um, wrap it up by saying I have the experience, the skills, and the track record to get things done. I've built relationships and I know how to navigate among all the players whose cooperation you need to get things done. If we're really going to productively and positively address the various issues that are important to us and that confront us, and we, if we're able and we're going to protect our local values and really sustain what is special about Marin County, we need to be able to work together and find common ground. That is exactly how I do my job as your supervisor, and I look forward to continuing to work together. And I look forward to your questions. So thank you for having me. I brought my stopwatch, but I only have three minutes of material, so I'll get out of here fast. Um, I was a treasurer and president of Utah uh, for a few years. 
I was active in re with re Repeal Smart. Uh, I was started as co plaintiff with the Howard Jar Jarvis organization to fight the Cal Fire tax. <laughs> Status. So you folks might be getting a check pretty soon because uh, we're sure to win if, if uh, once we get litigated. Uh, I am a, if I'm elected to the Board of Supervisors, the first thing I want to do is stop wasting millions of dollars on consultants. If our county staff can't do the job in-house, let's replace them with somebody who can. The supervisor just approved $98,000 for a consultant to study sedimentation on my road. If they would spend the $98,000 on asphalt to repave my road, there would be no sedimentation to study. <laughs> the first responsibility of the supervisors is to keep the roads paved and in good condition. Not just the main highways, but our residential streets, which are in terrible repair. Other states don't even have supervisors as such. Their counties have road commissioners because the job is so important. I hear complaints about too much traffic, too much development, too many people, and many of, us, many of us feel that our quality of life is threatened. I'm all for affordable housing, but I personally do not feel obligated to make room for more people or the increased traffic they would bring. Marin is a finite space and our roads are at their carrying capacity. We need to stop spending tax dollars on encouraging people to visit Marin. Only a handful of businesses benefit from these tourists while we have to put up with the traffic. Neither do I want to drive through the countryside and see a bunch of signs at every ranch driveway advertising bed and breakfast, cheese tasting, wine tasting. The ranchers in Marin, with the help of Malt, have done a good job holding off development. But I don't want West Marin to start looking like the Jersey Shore because ranchers are no longer content with just ranching. Neither do I want to see a string of wind cups strung like a necklace up and down Smart's right of way. We thought we had development beat during the drought of the 70s. McKinsey lobbied to bring in Rus Russian River water and the developers took over. Marin is awash in tax dollars due to high property valuations. Some of this money should be returned to the taxpayers as an annual credit against their property taxes. We should make every effort to renegotiate the pensions of the rich and famous, such as Mansurian's $352,000 a year pension, and ultimately cap all pensions at $100,000. I think of pensions as a safety net, not as a windfall. Teachers are lucky to get $35,000 a year upon retirement because their benefits are based on a 2% retirement factor, while police and firemen are given 3%, resulting in much larger pensions. Now, I don't begrudge the salaries of police and fire, but pensions need to be more realistic. The U.S. Department of Labor does, it, does not even list police and fire among, as among the 10 most dangerous occupations. It's actually more dangerous, dangerous to be a UPS driver. <laughs> Finally, I do not believe that elected officials should receive a pension for their time in office. Public service should be its own reward. Thank you. For putting on this event this evening. My name is Dominic Grossi, and I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and where I came from. So I'm a fourth generation rancher, born and raised here in Novato, spent my whole life on our family's ranch. Uh, my great grandfather immigrated here in 1896. So I'm very deeply rooted. In, in what happens here in West Marin is extremely important to me. I grew up, went through school, went to Cal Poly State University, got a degree, dairy science, agricultural business minor. So I bring a, a business background as well into my running for, for fourth district supervisor. And over the years now, since graduating from school, after that conscious decision to stay on the family farm, which is very important to me, something I want to be able to pass on to my children and that legacy, is my involvement in my, my community, specifically the ag community thus far, and I'm hoping to expand upon that with this run. And over those last 20 years, having served as president of our, our Marin County Farm Bureau for almost six years, I was extremely active working with supervisors, uh, department heads, working on planning commission issues, um, policy issues, land use, zoning, 
and, and in fact served on an agritourism committee that I was appointed to by the county, um, as well as an expenditure plan working group. They were looking to put a tax several years, about six years ago, and thankfully that tax was not even brought, brought to the people. Um, as well as a member of the Marin Regulatory Improvement Advisory Committee. And this committee, to me, uh, was very important because we see over the years that all of the building and permit and the processes that we're going through to try to get anything done in Marin County has become more and more difficult. And that's something I would like to see changed. You know, in order to make progress, I think we need to back off a little bit on the regulatory issues that are killing small businesses, uh, the building permits, the whole process has become very expensive, timely, and costly. Now, I'm not advocating that we go out and build big wind cups, but I just want to make it easier for the person who has a home who wants to do a small addition or build onto uh, their own house, or if you're building a home on, an, on a, a lot that has no homes on it, our county should not be running you through the ringer. We shouldn't be having to completely explain ourselves and defend ourselves against every neighbor. Okay? If we're not breaking any of the rules, why are we having to defend ourselves? Why is it so difficult to do these things? And, and to me, that becomes a serious issue. So one of the main reasons I am running, though, is to, to look at West Marin and the beautiful place that it is and continue to protect it. This is where I grew up, my home, my family. And I want to make sure that that is still there for future generations to come for all of our children. And sometimes I worry that it's not going to be. Now, we heard malt was just mentioned. I spent six years on the malt board as well. They've done a fabulous job of, of continuing to protect the land. The A60 zoning that was implemented back in the late 70s when Gary Giacomini was a supervisor also helped pave that way. It made it very clear that the people of Moran wanted to continue to protect that land. So you can look at something that's happened right now. There was a lawsuit recently filed against the National Park Service. Okay, this is something very near and dear to me, that they want to try to eliminate ranching from the park. And I am, of course, stoutly against this. The ranches were created long before the park was there, and when the park did come along, it was done by a coalition of ranchers and farmers. They worked together with the Park Service to create a park that was always intended to have ranching, so that when the people would go and visit the park, they would be able to see the ranches out there, see working ranches. That was always intended when Clem Miller wrote that bill in 62, and it's always has been. And we have had a very close relationship with the uh, environmental community and worked with them. And I'm very proud to have been part of that as president of Farm Bureau, working with the likes of the environmental community. And so what we're seeing right now is an extreme, as far as I'm concerned, an extreme group that is trying to run the uh, ranches out of the park. So that's where I stand on that particular issue. You move to the Inland Corridor, and we've all been hearing it when it comes to the traffic issue and affordable housing. And the traffic issue to me is an absolute nightmare, both in on 101, but also out going up Highway 1. And, there is, and that is a tourist issue. But we've got to remember that tourism is an extremely important part of our local economy. So this is something that takes balance. And this is where affordable housing could help. Now, it's not going to help a lot to go and build a few homes here and there, but it will help. We need to do a ton of different things when it comes to traffic. There's no one simple answer. Uh, we heard the pilot program for the school buses, the yellow bus program mentioned earlier. I'm a staunch advocate of that. I think that's the right direction. Since 20% of our traffic in Marin County is caused because people are just trying to get their kids to school. And that's why working with MCBC, the Marin, uh, Marin County Biking Coalition, to try to improve uh, the roads, and I know some people are completely against the bike paths, but at least let's make it safe so those kids that are on bikes can get to school without having to have their parents drive them to school. Um, the other thing that we need to do besides the yellow bus program, which I think will need to expand through all of Marin County, is, is to start working a little more closely with Sonoma County. No one's talked about that. Marin County only grew by 5,000 residents between 2000 and 2010. Sonoma County grew by 25,000. And yet, we're not making any effort to reach out to them and build a coalition. I've already done that. I talked to David Rabbit, who is a supervisor in Sonoma County. He said, what can we do to work together to try to get fewer people in cars in Sonoma County? It comes to infrastructure. I think we need to have better parking lots, more parking structures in Sonoma County, so they're not even getting here, so there's fewer cars. But we need to work together, and those partnerships are very important. So you can move on to affordable housing. Now, affordable housing is important because there's a lot of people here 
that, let's face it, you can't afford to live here. But there are several service jobs, important service jobs, protective service jobs in Marin County that I'm sure people would like to be able to live here. Should we build wind cups? No, not a favor of that at all. But we need to be smart about how we do it. There needs to be building which promotes our general economy, make sure that our plumbers, our electrician, our builders do have work ahead of them. We need to keep our economy moving forward. There's going to be some growth, and I think that's important. But it should be done in places that are close, close proximity to uh, public transportation. So those all need to play an important factor. I just don't think they should be massive. We find that 24 to 36 units here and there, I think it would fit more into the integrity of Mar what Marin County is. Um, and something else that's really important to me is education that no one else is talking about. And I hear this being maybe it's because I'm in Novato and a lot of people up there it was number three on their list of important issues. And we're not providing, in my opinion, the right kind of education for everybody. We all want our kids to go to college. That's just a fact. Everybody wants them to go to college and be successful. But we have to be honest with ourselves. A lot of kids aren't going to go that route. And when they're done with high school, they didn't get any training in high school to learn any sort of real technical skills, whether it is, becomes a plumber or a welder or an electrician. And this really started to hit me just about six months ago when my son started in seventh grade, or sixth grade at the middle school in Sinaloa. And they had just removed their shop class a few years ago. So kids aren't working with their hands. We're trying to push every kid and funnel them to college, which is great to maybe try that, but you cannot ignore the kids behind. Um, and so I, th I would love to see small amounts of money work into programs where we can actually get some more classes that would bring in the right kind of teachers where we can teach kids trades, multiple trades, so they can at least learn a little bit to figure out where they want to go in their lives because they can become very productive members of our society if we give them opportunities in school when they're growing up. Um, and with that, I, I would just say that my experience working with supervisors and, and planning commissioners over the last 15 years, you know, we all have that. I think we've all been involved, and that's what got us to this point. But I've also ha been appointed to uh, the California Beef Council by our Secretary of Agriculture, I've, uh, as well as uh, California Dairy Task Force, the Secretary of Ag, locally State Secretary of Ag appointed me to that. And I'm currently the chair or the president of Sonoma Marin Fair Board. I was appointed to that, that fair board by Schwarzenegger seven years ago, and I've been reappointed by Gary Brown, Jerry Brown, uh, two years ago. And so what it shows is that I'm a person that works with both sides, whether as president of Farm Bureau working with the environmentalists and the ranchers to bring people together and find solutions, and I'm recognized as somebody who does work to solve problems and work with both sides of, of uh, the aisle. So I hope you will consider me and look forward to answering questions later. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's a, a pleasure to address you. And um, I am a, a 46-year resident of Marin County. I came here from the flatlands of Ohio. And um, I was coming through, you know, traveling around, and somebody took me to... I was traveling through and somebody took me to the top of Mount Tam. And if you've lived in the flatlands of Ohio, you can imagine what I felt like when I was taken up to this majestic mountain and looked out and said, oh my God, well, you know, have I died and gone to heaven? And of course I had. And I feel very, very blessed that I was able to land here. And fortunate that I was able to buy what was probably the last inexpensive home that was available in Marin County back in 1995. For the last 16 years, I uh, have been the program director for a program that you've heard mentioned a number of times now called Safe Routes to Schools. Um, I'm the founder of that program. We were the first in the nation to establish a Safe Routes to Schools program. I worked with my friend Deb Hupsmith, who recently passed, sadly passed away, uh, to establish this program. And in the first two years, we went from 21% of the kids walking and biking to school to 38% of the kids walking and biking to school. A lot of people here are talking about the traffic problems that we are experiencing here in Marin County. I am the one person here who has actually done something about it. Uh, has any, did anybody notice last week that it was a lot easier to get around? That's because it was ski week. School was out. 
Our, if the first thing we can do about our traffic problem is address the school traffic issue, which is what I've been doing for all these years. We now have 50% uh, – half of our kids are now getting what we call a green way to school. They're either walking, biking, um, taking the bus, or carpooling to school. But I want us to do better. So people have been mentioning the, the yellow bus study. I actually participated in working on that yellow bus study. And it is my uh, goal to bring back the yellow buses to all of Marin County because I think that is the next step of what we need to do to reduce traffic congestion. We also need to improve our transit. One of the things I know from working in transportation for all these many years is people will use transit if it's convenient, if it's accessible, and if it's frequent. And the problem we have in Marin County, because we are a low-density suburban county, is our transit is not frequent. And somewhere where it would take you maybe a half hour to drive there could actually take you two hours to go by transit. We have some really brilliant people now working at Marin Transit who are really looking at creative ways to improve our transit system. And so it works on both sides of it. We have to – it's a chicken and egg thing. People won't use the transit unless it's what I just said, frequent, convenient, uncomfortable. And – but it can't be frequent unless people use it. So one of the things that we have been doing with um, Safe Routes to Schools is we've been working with the teens. We did a program called The Great Race. And they divided up in teams and they had to take three different um, transit to get to various locations of their choice. And then they took selfies of themselves when they got there and got on the next bus. And we interviewed the kids afterwards and all of them said, wow, this was really great. And would you use transit again? Yeah, of course I would use transit again. Now, one of the reasons I started working with Safe Routes Schools is because I know that people our age, it's kind of hard to adopt new habits. But if we can teach the next generation that there are other ways to get around besides driving, this is how we slowly but surely start improving our transportation systems. One of the reasons I want uh, – what I want to bring to the Office of Supervisor is my experience of bringing people together. And a lot of us here have been talking about the various different ways in which they have worked together and, and reached across the aisles and brought people together. And this is what I've done with Safe Routes to Schools. When we started out, what I had is very angry parents who wanted a stop sign on their street or wanted the cars to slow down, and very frustrated public works directors who said, we can't do that. So they'd say, this is what we want, and the public works director saying, we can't do that, and there's an impasse. And what, I, what needs to happen is you need to back away from the positions of, you have to do this, no, we can't do it. And start with accepting, do we all agree on the problem? The problem is that the cars are going too fast. And what are the various solutions to that? And in working with these task forces where I bring together the parents, public works directors, the police department, the school district, and, um, and neighborhoods, and working with them, we come up with solutions. Now, sometimes we come up with solutions, and later on people find out that it's coming and they don't like it. And that is inevitable, that you don't always get everybody involved in the initial conversation. But by and large, 90 percent of the time, the, we've put in $30 million worth of improvements. And by and large, they have been very well received by the communities that we have worked in. This is what I want to bring to the Office of Supervisor, this kind of a process. I, I think that one of the handicaps that our, our public officials have is the way in which things are done is that you have to have – you have public hearings. And what I find is there's not a lot of hearing that goes on at public hearings. And that's not just about what – if the supervisors are listening what the people are saying, it's like people are not hearing what each other is saying. I've sat in those hearings. I've been on one side of a debate. And I find that, you know, a lot of people, they have their say and they leave. I stay. And I listen to what everybody has to say. And sometimes people who I may not agree with 
overall on the issue are saying things and talking about concerns that I understand and I listen to and I go, okay, that's, a, that's an important concern. We should take that into consideration. What I've been doing in, in my campaign is I've been going around and I've been listening to what people have to say and what some of their concerns are. I talked to a fellow in Corte Madera. He lives on one of the, uh, you know, one of the wa waterways. It's marshland. It's, it's um, part of the Bay, Air Bay, and it's a place where the sea level may rise. It's been designated a flood zone, and his insurance company is going to raise uh, his flood insurance as a result of that. However, the Army Corps of Engineers is not going to let him do anything to protect his property. And so when, when we're at the mercy of state and federal organizations and agencies that have rules that keep us from doing the very things we need to do to solve our problems, I think it is the responsibility of the supervisors to work with our elected officials on the state and federal level to try to change those rules or modify those rules or work in a way that we can actually solve our problems here. That brings us to the housing problem that we have in Marin County. Uh, I, I think that, you know, everyone agrees we don't want to change the character of Marin. So how do, but everybody who gets up and says, I don't want this high density housing, usually prefaces by saying I'm all for affordable housing. So I'm going to assume that most people, not all people, but most people is all, are all for affordable housing. And in Marin County, affordable housing is just about everybody because it's not just about the low-income people. There's also the, the hole in the middle, the, the, the people who don't qualify for low-income housing and can't afford the high-income housing. And those are the people who are being driven away. One of the other things I heard is from one of our school board members in Corte Madera that they can't find teachers. They've got a growing enrollment, but the teachers don't want to teach there because they can't find a place to live. And as many people, as some people have mentioned already, that's why we have so much traffic on our roads, is because the people who work here don't live here, and the people who do live here and are paying a very high price for the homes have to go down to San Francisco and Silicon Valley for their jobs. So if we're going to solve a problem, we have to start with acknowledging what's causing the problem and that we have a problem. And then it's a matter of getting creative and working together. Marin has a long history of innovation. We were the first to develop urban growth boundaries. We were the first to develop an agricultural land trust. We were the first to, we, we lead the nation in our organic farming industry. We started Marin Clean Energy, the first community choice energy. I was proud to be the, to be the founder of the first Safe Routes to Schools program in the nation, which is now present in every single state and every single city in this country. And I've traveled around the country and taught people how to start this program. I really do believe in the people of Marin. Now the f one of the things I cannot, you know, even though I'm talking mostly to people here in the urbanized area of Marin, is there anybody who's actually from West Marin besides the candidates? One person, a couple people besides the candidates. Those of us in West Marin, we have a magnificent landscape. We have preserved our environment uh, to such a degree that we should be very, very proud of our environmental stewardship. At the same time, we preserved our agriculture industry, and, and I totally agree with Dominic about the threat to our agriculture, that we have a domino effect. If we lose those ranches in the park, we could lose the entire industry because the support services will no longer be viable. So this is a very serious threat that we're facing. So we have our environment and we have our agriculture, but what's missing from a lot of people when they discuss West Marin is the people who actually live in West Marin. And those of us who live in West Marin, our supervisor is the only government we have. They're the only people who can help us out. And what I'm finding from talking to people in West Marin is they are sadly, sadly neglected. They have been losing their social service workers to the point where they have one person who's working up and down the coast trying to serve the seniors from, you know, Stinson Beach all the way to Point Reyes. Actually, all the way from Muir Woods, Muir Beach all the way to Point Reyes. And 
they don't have any paratransit service. If you are frail and elderly and you live in West Marin, you are dependent on the kindness of strangers if you're going to get to your doctor's appointment. They would like to have a bus going to Novato, and they've asked Marin Transit, and Marin Transit says, well, we can't have enough ridership to justify such a bus. When you're talking about the rural areas of West Marin, we can't be counting it by just, by just the population. Of course it's a sparse population, but that doesn't mean we don't serve the people of West Marin. I intend to serve the people on all of the districts, and it's a sprawling district, uh, the 4th District, and I intend to serve all of the communities. And I thank you very much for having me here, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to uh, be invited here to speak with you tonight. The, the 4th District, since no one really uh, had an opportunity to describe it in detail, it's a sprawling, massive area. It, it encompasses roughly half of the county of Marin. It includes all of our, most of our parks. It goes all the way from western Nevada, um, uh, all the way along the coast, all the way to Homestead Valley in Mill Valley. It, uh, it's, it's absolutely enormous, and it has uh, a very diverse economies of uh, ranching, farming, as you've heard, and um, interestingly enough was gerrymandered to include the Canal District of San Rafael, as well as Corona Madera and a portion of Larkspur. So it is probably the single most diverse of all the districts. Instead of talking about the subjects that have been covered uh, tonight, I'll take a slightly different tack and talk about some of the regulations that uh, recently were passed by the state and are being currently imposed on our district. Um, these regulations primarily deal with the environment, and the one in particular that I'll start with is AB 885. It's a state uh, law that requires that when a body of water is desig designated as impaired because of nitrogen content or uh, a variety of other uh, toxic materials, uh, sediments and other things in the water, uh, it immediately triggers a whole series of additional criterion that um, all of the homeowners will have to abide by. Uh, specifically, the uh, AB885 um, changes the setbacks from uh, the creeks, which traditionally have been 100 feet, uh, to 600 feet. And what this means is that automatically, if you apply for a permit now because the bodies of water are deemed impaired uh, for anything, you will now be required to spend anywhere between forty and sixty thousand dollars upgrading your septic systems. I realize that for those of you that are in the uh, urban areas of Marin, you're probably not particularly familiar with septic systems, but most of the district are on septic. Most of the district are unincorporated, and a majority of the properties and homeowners have to deal with this stuff. What this means is that um, any time uh, a, a property exchanges hands, any time you apply for permits, uh, an enormous cost is going to be incurred by the, by the homeowner or possibly the follow-up homeowner. Um, this is a pretty serious subject, and what this particular legislation is going to also do is increase the likelihood that what is called micro-sewage districts, which have been popping up all over West Marin uh, for local communities, are going to occur more and more. These districts have a history of having problems. One of uh, a good example of that is uh, the town of Tamales, uh, about 30 years ago, installed one of these micro sewer districts and has been in financial straits ever since. Uh, they're nearing the state of bankruptcy and recently attempted to uh, force the local school district to pay them uh, an enormous amount of money, which luckily the school district uh, was, uh, was able to avoid. Point being is that um, it's unfortunate that at this point, these uh, very, very complex and very costly uh, pieces of legislation are now being handed down by the state, and there are very, very few things that the homeowners have an opportunity to do to deal with, other than out-of-pocket forty to sixty thousand dollars. The 
the one thing that I wanted to talk a little more about also in terms of these uh, pocket sewage districts is that um, they, the, advent, uh, the advent of uh, AB 885 is going to force many, many additional of these districts to show up. And they're really going to create an enormous uh, problem for, for everyone um, in, in the 4th District simply because as they begin to go bankrupt, as they begin to fail, the, um, the local communities uh, are going to have all kinds of problems trying to meet their, uh, their sewage requirements. The last thing I wanted to mention uh, in terms of what's going on out in West Marin is the county is in the process now of developing what's called a local coastal program. Now this is the, the set of codes and set of criterion by which development along the coastline will be governed. Uh, the siting, the specific um, way in which uh, the, the developments will be monitored and allowed, allowed to, to exist and to, to be built um, are right now in the process of, of, of being developed. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate that at this point the county has not done a very good job of narrowing the criteria and are actually in violation of uh, state uh, coastal law. And the, that seems at this point because of the extremely broad way that uh, agriculture has been defined in the local coastal program uh, as it's now formed, uh, there's a possibility of an additional 1.5 million square feet that could be uh, built along the coastline. And so for the subject, uh, the two subjects that have been discussed a great deal, which is both in terms of housing and in terms of traffic, we're going to see, we're going to see pretty substantial changes if these, if these new uh, uh, policies are not further, further controlled and further developed. Um, um, uh, I should talk about myself a little bit. I am a third generation Californian. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, be born in San Francisco and raised uh, uh, for my entire life in Marin County. Went to uh, Drake High School and have been involved in a number of organizations over the years. I've been very active in the environmental community and am currently the chair of the San Geronimo Valley Planning Group, which is a planning body that uh, oversees a variety of different um, proposals. Um, luckily, uh, uh, those of us uh, that uh, have the uh, advantage and the opportunity to live in and own property in, in West Marin have been, uh, um, have been blessed with the very activist community and uh, um, an absolutely fantastic, as, uh, as Wendy had mentioned, an absolutely gorgeous environment and the, a community that feels very strongly about maintaining the character of, of our community. These new regulations, as, they've, uh, as they're being implemented, uh, we're going to see an enormous amount of changes in our communities. Um, I believe that the supervisor is in a unique position where they can make sure that these kinds of changes are, are gradual and m done in a particular way so that the character is not radically modified. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, hope that you consider me for supervisor and uh, look forward to your questions. This is Mary Tamburo, and uh, I'm the new kid on the block, I guess, since uh, I've only lived in Marin for about 15, 16 years. Um, I've lived in the Bay Area for uh, more than 20 years, and I, I come from a non-political background, although I've done a lot of community volunteering, mostly in uh, marketing, communications, and social media, and uh, music. I hail from the music world where collaboration is a requirement for success, at least one song at a time. You know, each person can have play a different instrument, have a different role, but we all have to be in the same groove and have the goal of uh, mutual satisfaction for whoever's listening. And so, just give you uh, a little bit of a story on how I ended up wanting to run for supervisor. Hey, Scott. Um, I was thrust into the political arena in 2010, July of 2010, when um, 
Uh, we were just finished six years making a CD that was about 30 years in the making. That's a whole story in itself. But uh, we received a letter from the DPW saying, hey, we're building a sidewalk on your street. And uh, we were pretty shocked uh, about that. We en ended up going to a meeting to find that a, a, side, a Safe Routes to Schools project was uh, in planning for three to four years without any of us knowing about it who lived on the street. And um, so I thought, wow, well, that's a good idea. You know, I, I walk up and down the street about three, four times a day. That's how I get my exercise. I walk back and forth to Whole Foods. I live in Homestead Valley. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, this, this is okay. And I've done a lot of um, research in about bicycles and walking because I had a little nonprofit project called the Vehicle for Change. And I like to stay abreast of what's new and what's happening and how we can uh, save the environment, reduce carbon emissions. And so I'm very interested in cars. I used to sell cars, one of my gigs between gigs. But we went to this meeting and it was, it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. People were screaming. There were, you know, we found out that um, the, there was uh, an application for three different times and finally they were so happy that they got it. And uh, the D DPW was quite taken aback by the surprise of the community and the negative response that they got because as far as they knew, the community wanted a sidewalk. So uh, being that I have a background in communications, I sort of became the ad hoc chair of, of an impromptu follow-up meeting done by the neighbors and since the sidewalk wasn't going to be put on my side of the street, I figured, well, that would give me a little bit of neutrality so people won't think it's just because I don't want a sidewalk in front of my house. And anyway, to make a long story short, I know everybody will be a little too late for that, but uh, to make a long story short, as we, we delve deeper into this, I discovered uh, so many things that need fixing on the county level. And this is not to say, you know, that there's uh, some people want to call corruption. What I see is just tunnel vision and uh, not enough um, interdepartmental communication and underfunding. Uh, several of the department engineers came to me in confidence, and I will not reveal their names. Uh, each had a different story to tell, and um, I found myself being the, the point person just put a shingle out and everyone come to me and this is something that I uh, found over the years that I have this knack for assessing a situation, taking in data and communicating it in simple uh, language so that many people can understand it and then we can come to an agreement. But we tried really hard to uh, have a permeable path because we have a creek, the county skipped CEQA, we had uh, a lot of people ignored what we, what we said. The sidewalk went in. It was a huge controversy. And since the sidewalk, the safer route to school went in, we've had five accidents on our street because we have uh, increased in speeding cars. And there are a lot of unhappy neighbors. And I've gotten no response from the DPW, who has, now has a new executive, uh, new director. And uh, so I said, you know, I have a lot of ideas, and I know this was a well-intentioned project. I'm a very uh, big admirer of Safe Routes to Schools and what they're attempting to do. But what I see is it's a Band-Aid. We keep trying to fix the traffic when we're not addressing the land use issues. You can't have, you can't stick a commuter school in the middle of a neighborhood against that neighborhood's community plan and expect not to have problems. And uh, the same thing goes with you take out a hardware store that was downtown and now it's on the freeway, people need to leave the town to get to, to get a screw. It just doesn't make any sense. So what we need to do is we need to assess the services and the products that, that we need in our downtown areas and uh, do, say, community, community loan funds to retain these businesses that will keep people downtown and be serviced there, so I don't have to drive everywhere for every little thing. And uh, I've done a lot of research in this area, and I have, uh, although I don't really have much experience I'm on uh, political, in the political arena, I, I take that as a positive, because I have a lot of experience from, that, from the outside world, because it really is like night and day sometimes. And so, I want to get in there with a fresh perspective, roll up my sleeves, 
and uh, you know see if we can't take a look at some of the problems that are plaguing our county and not only stop it from getting worse but restore some of the character that we've lost uh, throughout the years and you know let's let's do some common sense planning from you know this day forward I guess that's it <laughs> for now I look forward to your question. My question is to you, Kevin. You mentioned traffic along. Oh, there you go. Traffic along Sir Francis Drake. Boy, that's a big issue. I've been thinking about that for the past 50 years. It's two lane road. How are you ever going to improve it? What thoughts do you have on fixing that? Well, the biggest focus that I've had on Sir Francis Drake is in. The biggest focus that I've had for Spring Strait is in the section of St. Francis Strait where the traffic congestion is absolutely the worst and has been the worst for years. And that's the section basically between Ross and, and 101. Primarily the, the section of the roadway right here, you know, right in front of Bon Air Shopping Center. Um, that roadway is actually pretty wide. And there are, in fact, are opportunities with some clever planning to expand the capacity of that roadway in a way that will increase the flow of traffic, particularly going from west to east, which is where the problem really occurs. I think if we actually focused on that and eliminated some of the other alternatives that have been considered by the county, particularly <coughs> the installation of bike lanes along that stretch, which would not be used by hardly anybody, if anybody, then we actually can make some material improvements um, throughout the entire St. Francis Strait corridor. Um, and as I also mentioned in my little presentation, um, we have an opportunity now to implement um, uh, improvements in our traffic signal control system um, at relatively low cost. What I've been told when I've been meeting with uh, county planners is that, well, we don't want to do that because we want to develop these other strategies like the installation of, of bulb outs and corridors and bike lanes, even beautification <coughs> projects that would uh, uh, prevent them from actually figuring out how to do the signal clean project. So we have to put that off for like five years until we can build bulb outs. That's ridiculous. We ought to go forward right now, focus on expanding the, the, the vehicle capa vehicular capacity of that stretch of St. Francis Strait. Um, pay the money, which is not that great, to put in a modern signaling, signaling system for that stretch of the road, and our traffic problems will be reduced significantly along that corridor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, my question is for anybody that will take it. Um, there's there's a problems that have been around. With a new one, not real new, but a terrible problem with the <coughs> NFL bridge. And, you know, what we're hearing from current government is that we're looking at it, we've got consultants, and sometime in 2017 maybe we'll start building. I remember when I first moved here, that, that bridge had three lanes going in each direction. Mm -hmm. And what are we studying? And, and, and what would ever, anybody that's running for office, what, what can you do to speed up the process? That's, that's a huge problem in this county. Well, I don't know what we're waiting for. So <laughs> I'll just say one, one thing that I know, in, in my role as chairman of the Marine Coalition, our speaker last month was Mark Levine, mm -hmm. Assemblyman Mark Levine, who was explaining to us that one of the things about that third lane is that Caltrans <coughs> currently has a contract with a painting company to store their vehicles on that third lane of the, of the, of the bridge. You know, Mark Levine's recommendation is that, you know, we get a permit and go and protest the fact that they, they can't renegotiate that contract so we could get the same third lane open. Mm. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for your questions. Second row. Can I add something? Sure. Uh, just on that question. Um, there, there's really no reason that we can't do that third lane within a matter of months. Um, one of the reasons that it's been held up, and I know there's been um, you know, legislative action to take it outside the scope of CEQA, which I'm not actually in favor of, because I think we can actually do that improvement within the framework that CEQA allows without a lot of significant delay. It's a simple, simple project. There is work that needs to be done, but under the environmental review process, the work that would be required 
in order to put that third lane in and to make the improvements on the east side of the bridge that will allow the traffic to flow smoothly on that third lane can be done quickly, can be done without a significant amount of environmental review, and should be done. It's being held up, it has been held up for years now, in large part because of the desire to put a bike lane <laughs> going across that bridge. And the bike lane has actually, has actually a very significant capital investment into that bridge. It would be a lot of work, and it would require significant environmental review. We ought to knock that off. We ought to just focus on putting the third lane in on that bridge, doing the improvements that are required in order to make that work, and it could be done in months. Okay. I uh, really have to respond to that because this is a, a myth that's been put out quite a bit that the bike lane, that the uh, the third lane is being held up by the bike lane. It's actually the other way around. It is the lane itself that is holding up the project. It has to do with the egress of exiting the bridge on the Richmond side. There are issues there that weren't there when the bridge was built that are there now that they now have to deal with. The bike lane is not the reason it's being held up. And we are, this project is moving forward and I think we will see that third lane within the next year or two. Mm -hmm. Certain plants and crops within Wren County are farmers, which would become completely isolated. We wouldn't be able to sell our products outside of Marin County. Mm -hmm. So that is something very scary for me to see that happen to them. So the really the goal would be to make sure that we don't have that and pest, those pest, the uh, pests get here in the first place. A lot of them come in on boats because we do import a lot of foods, not necessarily just to Marin County, but throughout the state of California. Once it gets here, it can travel. And so keeping the pests out to me, uh, preliminary. Um, Getting ahead of the problem, I guess, is more important. But I, I wouldn't personally rule out the use of it entirely. I just think sometimes it could be necessary, but it needs to be done with the willingness or the understanding by the people. They can get out of the way so they can move away from their community if it's going to be sprayed there. Most of the spraying that was that was projected that they thought about doing, and it never happened in 2007, <coughs> it was going to be on the island. Okay. It wasn't going to be anywhere near people's homes. We were going to make sure it stayed separate. So it didn't end up happening. It got stopped, and that worked out great. But to me, as a last resort, I, I think it needs to be on the table. Thank you, Dominic. Go ahead. Next. You, you were up oh. first. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm just standing up because oh, my please. back hurts. So oh, go for it. Oh. <laughs> um, oh. But I do want to comment. Go ahead, Lynn. Well, I, you know, my, you know, my personal feeling, um, you know, as someone who um, eats all organic, and um, promote sustainability, I would like to see all pesticides be banned, not just publicly, but privately. I find it interesting that when I received some of the positions <coughs> from Marine Conservation League, which is the oldest and most respected environmental organization in Marin, they have a more nuanced position about pesticides because of their concern for endangered species and um, for fire danger. Uh, I happen to live right next to the open space, so I'm acutely aware of fire danger. And, um, and I know that there have been many attempts to try to use the alternative means, and yet these invasive species remain. Uh, I think we're in, uh, Water District um, has taken the approach that if we just ban the pesticides and take them off the table, we'll find alternatives. I think that's an interesting approach. So as you can see, I'm still studying the issue. What I want and what is needed might be two different things, and so that's where I hate to be a, a sort of a political nuanced person, but I'm being honest. No rice and rice? No, it's Sears. That's the other one. It's 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 the other one. Yeah, so Barbara, thanks very much for bringing up that question. And not a surprise, because you asked that, i got to say. And so for people who have heard me speak at the Board of Supervisors before, you will know that I have significant problems with toxins in our environment of any sort, including glyphosate. And I encourage everyone to watch the video of the workshop that our board did in September on this issue, where we really tightened up the circumstances in which our staff could even think about using glyphosate. Um, as a couple of our speakers have said, one of the challenges here from the county's perspective is we're, doing, we're working with parks and recreational areas, and in those areas we have banned the use of glyphosate from any area 
that is used by children, by adults, by people, anything that is close to people. And that was a very important, I think, clarification that came out of our workshop in September. The open space side is challenging because we do have, uh, you know, the county, you have, to, you have to create policies that work everywhere in the unincorporated areas of the county, and that's our ag lands as well as our more built up areas along the 101 corridor, and the needs and the challenges can be different. And so you, we do need to keep in mind the impact on our farmers and our grazing animals and for particular, particular kinds of plants. The fire danger piece is, is incredibly challenging, and we get a lot of pushback from our firefighters about you need to you know, keep all tools there to make us safe. So, and then we have, as was mentioned, we have a lot of folks in our community who are very concerned about particular kinds of endangered plant species. And that in itself is a complicated topic, right? I always say, in the world of climate change, what's a native plant? This is a moving target, and I think we need to think carefully about what we do going forward and how is our environment going to change going forward. So. Not only did we really tighten up standards uh, in our September workshop, but I've been pushing hard on our staff to look for alternatives for glyphosate. And, I've, and I, want to, I want to say that I'm making progress, and I think we have an interim uh, parks and open space uh, director now who is much more open to looking at alternatives and somewhat less concerned about if there are other products that are less toxic that cost more, we should be considering that. And so I take that as a very hopeful sign. And obviously this issue is going to come back to us uh, on Tuesday, so there's, there's a lot more conversation. <laughs> but you know, my goal, and, and really the goal of our IPM program, is to get to zero. The issue that I think we all need to think carefully about and talk about is how fast we can get there, you know, keeping in mind some of our, our range, our farmer's issues, and, and our fire issues, and how do we deal with all of it. So nuance is, is very important. Getting rid of our toxins that endanger us <coughs> is also important. Frank Thank you, Supervisor Sears. You're welcome. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Frank, 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 to that? T take your pick. Frank, go ahead. Oh, Frank, go ahead. So I sit on an agency board, the Marine Salon Mosquito Vector Control District, that sprays pesticides on a daily basis. And I'm like a double agent on that board because I'm constantly asking a question about the inert ingredients. Our agency says, well, the EPA has, uh, has authorized the use of this pesticide. We know maybe 7 to 8% of what's in the pesticide because it's listed on, on, the, on the container. We don't know what 92% of the pesticide is because it's e either inert or other ingredients. And I've always taken a position, if I, as a public official, am being asked to use pesticides in a location, I can't possibly vote for it unless I know that what I'm spraying is safe. 62,000 new pesticides have been brought on the market in the past, <coughs> oh, what is it, 30 years now. The EPA has studied, looked at, and studied 200 of them, which means 61,800 pesticides that their EPA has not addressed them at all. And somehow, the, the, the government says, well, because of, of trade secrets, you don't have a right to know what's, what's being sprayed on you. And I say, that's a bunch of hooey. If a public agency is going to use pesticides, they need to know what's in that pesticide, what's, what's in the, in, in, in the, what the contents are. And if they can't find out what the contents are, they shouldn't be spraying at all, period, none, zero. You know, we don't need pesticides in our environment at all. Yeah. Yeah. I, just, I just want to throw in my own two cents. And I appreciate, Barbara, you're acknowledging my opposition to the use of glyphosate universally throughout the county. That's been a position. I'm sorry, I can't hear anything you're saying. Uh, okay, well, I'll speak up over the crowd. Yes. <laughs> Uh, it's been my position uh, in opposition to the use of glyphosate throughout the county for a long period of time, and I just want to clarify why, because it's actually quite simple. That was very interesting, Frank, about inert ingredients and all that sort of thing. But glyphosate is a special chemical, and the reason that it's special in this context is because the International Agency for Research on Cancer identified it as a probable human carcinogen last year. That triggered a regulatory process within the state of California 
which is going on now, uh, to list glyphosate as a chemical known to the state of California to cause cancer. That will have regulatory implications throughout the state. Among other things, it will require warnings by companies that use that material wherever. It doesn't apply to municipalities technically, but it should. It will require warnings of potential exposure to glyphosate in the use of that chemical anywhere. It also will prohibit private businesses from using that chemical in a way that could introduce it into a source of drinking water. Pretty much anywhere you use it in this county is going to create the potential for introducing it into a source of drinking water. It is wrong for the county to preserve an ability to put that chemical into our environment in a way that would be prohibited by you and me. It's just wrong. So I am opposed to it. I want to be very specific and focused, not on other chemicals, but on glyphosate in particular. We cannot tolerate the use of that chemical in this county, period. Out on Sir Francis Drake, the medians are used have glyphosate applied. That's where we're using it in this county. And I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add things. And, and thank you for bringing up the median because that's a really significant issue that hopefully will come up on Tuesday. The other thing that I didn't mention that I wanted to mention, I think, is everyone in this room who's thought about glyphosate knows the really large uses of glyphosate our private residences. And so one of the one of the issues that came up in our September workshop was launching a really widespread powerful public education campaign to get people to stop going to the big box stores and buying these toxins and using them in their garden. And I'm now that we're starting this new budget cycle, I've been working hard to see if we can locate some county funding to make that public campaign a reality. But but that doesn't have force of law. That's, that's just, hey, you know, I don't want you to do this, I don't want you to do that. People, Marin County has one of the highest cancer rates mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. You have workshops mm -hmm. this and workshops mm -hmm. that, but you haven't implemented the force of law. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to county, this guy, this guy, that guy. You need three votes. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting on that board, making mm -hmm. 135000 a year. No, I don't make that much. Whatever I wish I make. did. You need to get three votes. We wish you did, too. You need to get three votes that says no more use of this stuff. My wife has buried 15 people, okay? I don't know how long you've been there, you, Supervisor Rice, Supervisor Kimsey, you, you talk too much. You need to go agendize it, agendize it, okay? And don't make it so tough for people to get on the agenda, okay? You gotta get three people, you gotta get them to agree to something, you get it agendized, you know, and then everybody goes into these big parables, okay? People are dying. Lots of people are dying. Forget your workshops. Agendize it, get three votes, and get it out of here. Thanks for your yes. comment. Okay. Uh, my, my name is Mimi Willard, and um, I have a question for the supervisor candidates about what they are going to do when Larkspur Landing Station Area Plan comes back again, which it will, as promised to us by the MTC, and the developers are already now circling. And the last time around, uh, our supervisor in District 2, Katie Rice, said that she would defer to Larkspur and let them decide that she didn't think that this was something that the supervisors should intervene on. That was actually good because in Larkspur we killed it. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't know who's going to be on the council in Larkspur the next time around. Um, so my question for each of the supervisor candidates is, uh, what do you think should be the role of uh, the supervisors when Larkspur Landing 2 happens? Uh, is this a CEQA issue or, uh, or is there some other way that you feel that the supervisor should or should not be involved in the decision? Can I respond to that? Sure. It's, a, it's near near my heart. We're going to limit it to three responses because we're running up against a time frame here. I know there's other people that have questions. So. Give it to 67s or I, I think this might be the most important issue for the entire county because this will really. I'll tell you what, just keep your answers. I'll, 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 I'll keep it short. Mimi actually, act, Mimi actually provided okay. the answer uh, from my perspective because, as she will recall, and as many people in this room have participated in the process that we went through before, 
on Larkspur Station area, on the Larkspur Station area plan. The big concern and the big problem that I had was the inadequacy of the environmental review process that was conducted for that. Unfortunately, that was an environmental review process that was conducted by the city of Larkspur. It was a mess. Um, I figured that out. Other people in this room figured it out, and we opposed it. It is inconceivable to me that going forward, if that, process, if that project comes back, if that planning process comes back, that it will be sustained from a rigorous scrutiny of environmental issues under the, environment, the California Environmental Quality Act. But does, is this something that the supervisors can get involved in or no? Oh, you bet. Of course they can. And they can do it part by participating in the public process because under CEQA, the city of Larkspur would be the lead agency for purposes of that planning effort, but the county would be a responsible agency. And it has an obligation, affirmative obligation, to participate in that process and to raise the concerns that we raised and addressed in the context of the sequel process that we went through before to make sure that it doesn't happen again. But it's not on the agenda. Nothing's going to happen unless it gets on the agenda. If, if Everybody I am, talks about it, people are dying, if, has to get on the agenda, three votes, it's gone. If I am elected to the Marin County Board of Supervisors, it will be on the Have agenda. Have you tried? Why can't it be agendized now? Because I'm not on yet. <laughs> <laughs> to that and, and what could happen as, as a supervisor. One of the things that I think we're going to be facing is a continued onslaught <coughs> of regional pressures to do certain kinds of building, mm -hmm. and it'll still be building high-density housing near transit. Mm -hmm. And just to note, in a conversation with Steve Kinsey last Saturday, a part of what he was floating mm -hmm. was the idea that we should put our affordable housing on San Quentin. So there's a whole possibility of an even bigger project than just Larkspur Landing. It is a part of how we're facing the possibility of Marin facing pressures to just do a transformation that's even beyond what most of us can probably imagine at all. The second part of what I want to say quickly is that a big part of the outpouring that's helped stop the Larkspur Station Area Plan, in addition to the CEQA issues, is that under the umbrella of Citizen Marin, we helped organize hundreds of people that packed that room and brought the community out educating the community and engaging and empowering the community. So with whatever the issues are, supervisors or any of our elected <coughs> officials can always make a difference and they will always be the ones who eventually vote. But democracy and citizen engagement and having our communities have the values and characteristics that we want always depends on all of us in this room and beyond. Other candidates quick, quick, a quick one, a few words. Brian, yeah. The San Quentin Vision Plan was approved by the Marin County Board of Supervisors. <laughs> Two to three thousand living units will be built at San Quentin when the prison closes. If I'm elected, I will undo that San Quentin Vision Plan. Folks say, oh, don't worry, San Quentin will never close. There are two initiatives being circulated right now dealing with the death penalty. One will speed up the death penalty and restrict appeals. The other will eliminate the death penalty and throw it out. Both of those initiatives have a clause that says San Quentin State Prison is no longer death row. Once death row is no longer located at San Quentin, that prison is going to close. And we're going to be faced with two to 3,000 homes out in Point San Quentin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will fight that. Here it's Alex. Yeah, I agree with Frank. San Quentin is not going to happen. Next question, Ms. Dolan. Yes, um, thank you all for participating. I, I'd like to raise a question that has to do with balancing our love of community character and, again, some of the outside pressures that are on our community for development. Um, Several decades ago, it was Marin Cello. Now it's the Park Service. We're looking at a Park Service that's doubling the capacity of the Alcatraz Pier and plans to put one million people through Tam Junction uh, on their way to Muir Woods. The unintended consequences part is a number of us here, and Kate Sears was a very active participant in this, spent seven months working with Jared Huffman in the ad hoc 
group to create a memorandum of understanding between the county and the Park Service, which has already started to slide. So here's the unintended consequence, and I'd like Susan Kirsch and the people from who are running in District 4, because this is going to be right smack in your lap. We're talking about a million people coming. The idea right now is there's no ceiling being put directly on the attendance at Muir Woods. But aiming for a million visitors who will come over the next several years by bus. For those of you who dealt with the safety considerations and the transit considerations um, on the way out to West Marin, here's the map. Last year, 111,000 people came by shuttle bus. To reach a million, we would be looking at a tenfold increase on the buses on Highway 1, going through Tam Junction, and dealing with the congestion along Highway 1 and, and towards Muir Woods. So I, I would like to know what anybody would like to do about the unintended consequences of 10 times more buses going to Muir Woods. Supervisor, simple. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you. <laughs> You need to get it on the agenda, Kevin. I'm talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. Who mm -hmm. so would like to respond to that? Susan? Susan's over there. It's getting late. Well, that's okay. That's okay. You know, you raise a really good question, and it's a difficult question as it is in that context of how local control is slipping through our fingers in terms of regional agencies and national agencies. You know, so I don't have the answer for that. It's a part of looking at that. I, I've come out with concern about how there was not a cost benefit to us in moving forward with that agreement. I still think that's a concern for all of us. And, and again, I think it's a part of how eventually it'll be five people who might vote for that on the Board of Supervisors. And it is the work of all of us to be digging in to find the answers and the alternatives and weigh what we as a community want against what the, un not even unintended, what we can predict are the consequences of that. A question? Oh, does everybody want to respond to that? <coughs> really, I thought this was really intended as a district Four candidate oh, okay. uh, because Mirwoods is in District then? Four. I, th I think well, that's I mean, what Chris said. I need a clarification yeah. about the million plus visitors. Pardon me. The <laughs> million plus visitors to Mirwoods. I need a clarification on that. It's in writing in the memorandum of understanding, and I didn't hear a single District Four candidate address uh, the issue of Mirwoods and the enormous impact it's having all across the county and all across. Um, Mount Town. I think That's it's a public public safety issue, and I think we should not allow these tour companies, like on this point, bringing tourists to the Golden Gate Bridge and blocking the bridge. I've been stuck on traffic on the bridge because of these tour companies, and the ones that bring tourists out to Point Reyes. It's a public safety issue. I think the county needs to step up to it. Unfortunately, we don't have a Governor Christie type of guy who could stand up and just do it. You know, like the third lane on the bridge. Just do it. These, we're going to trip over these committees forever. We just have to do it. And it, I, I'd like the sheriff to go out on the bridge and come in a lane and just do it. Tam <coughs> Junction has been affected, so it would be interesting to hear from Supervisor Sears as well. Huh? I, I said that Tam Junction has been terrifically uh, affected, so it would be um, great to hear from Supervisor Sears as well. Uh, and I, I'll, but I really would like to hear from uh, District Four candidates because this is a, this is the clutch point. So uh, I think the reason I ask is because of not having read about this and knowing about this, you're asking me to respond to something I don't know what is actually in the memorandum of understanding. That's why I was looking to Kate Sears because I was hoping that you could clarify what is there's what is in this memorandum that um, that we're being asked about. Well, well, facts are we're gonna have a million I've visitors. Been, I've been if I may, I've been following this mm -hmm. and it is of great concern because I've been stuck in that traffic. Just uh, and, and because we've also uh, ridden on a bus to go to the Mount Tam Jam and other things. It's, 
pretty hairy rod. I can't imagine that much of an increase. It's just un it's inconceivable. So we're going to have to just uh, be a little more firm with the National Park Service uh, and, and make sure that they, they reduce that cap. A million vi visitors is, is a bit much. Um, it just doesn't seem... There's that one thing to the discussion. <coughs> AAA magazine, or AAA just came out with a yeah. whole thing on your yeah. woods yeah. and traveling to there yeah. and to Point Reyes. Just came out, landed in my mailbox two days ago, and Sunset Magazine did the same thing. Mm -hmm. So we are getting bombarded with advertisements by outside areas saying, go to these places, and it is going to have an effect. The county of Orange spends money every year trying to get more visitors here. <laughs> it's, it's ass backwards. I have one modification to the question, um, which perhaps will help the District 4 candidates to focus. Historically, um, there was quite a lot of data about how visitors to Marin might be adding to the economy. When there's a monopoly from the Park Service ferry that leaves San Francisco, goes on a bus, straight out to Muir Woods, back to the ferry, and back to San Francisco, no there no is no economic, economic benefit. And the profits mm -hmm. from the concessions at Muir Woods don't stay in Marin. Mm -hmm. Just the mm -hmm. traffic. Mm -hmm. So why do you ask your local supervisor to agendize the stuff? <laughs> 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 So, Wendy, let me, can I, I'm sorry, sure, go ahead. jump in no, just for a second, just to respond to your question, Wendy. What's in the Memorandum of Understanding is um, a, a reservation system for attendance at Muir Woods. And this was a hard, a hard fought, uh, as Kristen and other people here who participated, this was a hard fought uh, process. And um, uh, you know, and, and it didn't yield a perfect result. But let's let's just say it, it, what the goal is to reduce attendance, to smooth it out, so we don't have the incredible, unbelievable peaks of attendance. The Park Service says it's going to smooth out attendance, thereby reducing it, and perhaps even more importantly, to restrict parking that's close to Redwood Creek. A lot of this conversation started out as trying to deal with the traffic, which as we all know is a huge problem coming through Tam Valley, but the environmental impacts are also very important. And so, but you can't, you know, when we had the, the storms and when that was a year ago about the knocked out Shoreline Highway, and so the county thought, perfect, this is a great opportunity to, to halt any parking at Muir Woods. And boy, did we learn a lesson about how willful visitors are who don't care about the environment they're visiting. People parked everywhere. They took away signs that said no parking. It was a mess. And so it was actually, I think, somewhat helpful for our conversations with the Park Service, at least for those of us who thought, how come we can't do this right away, that uh, it, it, it's sort of a step-by-step -step process to really reduce the parking, do it in a way that people can't actually park where they shouldn't be parking that's too close to the creek and getting pollution, pollution into the creek. But we'll see, frankly, and I've said this before, we'll see how this works. I mean, the goal is to try to re make people have to get a reservation in order to go to the park so you can't just drive there, park anywhere you want, and overload the park. Um, we tried really hard to get the Park Service to actually use the C word, the cap word. And the best that they would do is to say, we're going to have parking, I mean, and reservation system, and that will smooth it out. And, you know, the devil's in the details, and we'll see how it works out. I come, my father spent years sending letters to the Park Service trying to get them to do things better. And um, I've inherited that attitude about the Park Service, and if you're not on them and not pushing, um, it's tough, and it's a federal agency, so they tend to think that they should just be able to do what they want. So it's very important that all of us, and I'm looking at Kristen and other people who are engaged in that process, um, this really is something that requires everybody who lives there to be attentive and, and pay attention to what's happening, provide information to the district or supervisor and to, and to me about what's going on so we can keep the pressure on. 
So if I, I don't know if that helps that, that, much, that's but that's helpful. a context. I mean, it, it, it talks about you know, the, the problem of, of being, of getting your news through the IJ, um, which is not terribly informative. Um, you know, you, you got the impression from reading what you read in the IJ that, you know, exactly what the Park Service was saying, that, you know, there was going to be less visitors to the park. So this is new information for me. I think we are um, we're in, a, in an interesting dilemma <coughs> in Marin County. We are blessed to live in a place where 80% of our land is permanently protected as open space and parkland, uh, you know, state, national, and local. And at the same time, it does also mean that we have national and state government who have authority over the land in our neighborhoods. Um, so we get to live with the open space, but we also have to live with, um, you know, the, the, the park service making decisions that we might not agree with or feel good about. And that goes back to, you know, having the kind of people who can work with those uh, agencies and really assert our local control. All right, Bob. Can I have another question? Sure. Okay. First of all, this has been a terrific evening. <laughs> I don't know yes. about how the rest of you feel, <laughs> but uh, there are a whole lot of things. That I've been in Ring County many years now, and I, I love this place. And boy, I'm telling you, the pesticide thing and, and Muir Woods, and these are all brand new things. And I got the AAA magazine, too, <laughs> okay. going, holy cow. Uh, I have a question for you, Kate. Okay. Uh, you have not said one word about what I believe, and then a lot of people that I represent believe, is one of the gravest problems that we have in uh, Marin County today. And that's the unfunded liability for the pensions and the increasing costs of health care for all of the people who work in Marin. Uh, we've been before you uh, mm -hmm. before, mm -hmm. and trust mm -hmm. me, we'll be before you again. Mm -hmm. I'm with Citizens for Sustainable Pension Plans. Mm -hmm. We all have seen what's been going on, and we have not seen, in our mind, much happening at all. And you've been sitting there mm -hmm. watching it, Kate. Explain to the people what your feeling is about. You bet, and I, uh, thanks for bringing that up, Bob. I did actually mention earlier that the last three years the county has reduced its re its retiree liability by 233 million. Yeah, that was and, we, and remember, we did in 2013 also create the OPEB, the other whatever it is, Post Employment Benefits Trust, um, that was a that saved the county money, and we put the, uh, we're putting the savings that from creating that trust for the first five years back into paying down our unfunded liabilities. And so, and that's, I think we've got 50 million now uh, in our retiree health trust fund. So we're, we are working to push it forward. And CSPP, you know, I need to give you and that organization a lot of credit. Um, I think it's, it's, it's not necessarily true that you haven't seen anything and it's definitely true that the county brought CSPP in close to work with us. And I think that that was a help to all of us. Now, granted, and I know your perspective, because <laughs> I do get to listen to you whenever you come, and I know that's going to keep up. Yeah, uh, I know, I know. And that's good, because these are, these are important issues. Um, you know, we, I think the county, we, we adopted PEPRA for new employees. We're really cutting down on uh, the, um, uh, the amount of benefits that our new employees are getting. So I think it's probably safe to say that our employees will be retiring later. They'll be putting more of their own funds into directed towards the benefits that they will get after retire. The retiring, the nut, of course, is the employees who are not new that have been with the county for a long time. And for all of our jurisdictions, this is a challenge. I'm not sort of underrating the challenge that we have. What we're trying to figure out is how to make progress as, as much as we can, as responsibly as we can, while also addressing some of our issue, other issues. Sometimes I feel like, and I'm not going to point my finger at you, Bob, 
But I oh, go ahead. But I might. <laughs> and and uh, sometimes I feel like there are folks who would like to say, why doesn't the county take all of its money and pay down all its, all its pension and retiree health liability? Well, that would solve that problem. It sure wouldn't help with a lot of the other obligations that we have and the other services we need to provide. Yeah, I think there should be more balance, frankly. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and I'm sure there's room for improvement. And, yeah. you know, every, and we talk a lot every year when we come up to the budget process about how are we going to put more money into roads, because I was telling you about how underfunded we are, and how are we going to put more money into our pension liabilities, um, because those are important obligations. And I know you're going to keep pushing on us, and that's good, because it keeps us focused. We're not against anybody. You got a question over here. Understood. I know it. Yeah, I just want to say that Susan Adams, during her entire term, touted to everybody and all of her fellow board members that she was not going to take a pension. She had a PhD in nursing. She was just going to be here to help everybody. And two days before her, her last day in office, she went and took her pension. And not one supervisor, including the lady standing up, said a word. Oh, no, and, I, and I'm going to say no, that the reason these pensions are run away is because, wait, please, I didn't interrupt you. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the reason these pensions are running away, because your department has to do what they're told. When you have little pet projects and everything else, and you need a project here and a project there, they do what they're told. When this wind cup was going in, you never said a word about it. That was true, Derek. Yeah, that's okay. But yeah. when the A bag, when two busloads of people went to A bag and Kinsey and Ray said okay, you didn't say a word. Oh, I don't know. Oh yeah, I do know. You know, you you want to have a study, but the point is they do what they're told, and that's why they get raises. They don't work a full year. They get vacations, they get extended time, they get sick time, they get this time, they get that time, and everybody pays their taxes. Nothing's changed. Since the day you started and were appointed, nothing has changed. Cancer's gone up, taxes have gone up, nothing's changed. You have studies, workshops at five o'clock during the week. Say, I invite people to my workshops, five o'clock during the week. They gotta drive to the county. It's ridiculous. You can't get there because of the traffic. Right. So, um, let me, let me, you've raised a lot of really important issues, and let I me address have. just a couple of them. What was that with Susan Adams? I'm, no, I'm going to start, oh. I'm going to start there with Susan Adams. And you can go back and find in the IJ the comment that I made that was probably somewhat intemperate about how disappointed I was by Susan Adams, because I had sat there on the board with her for however many years that was, hearing that she didn't take a pension. And, and I hate to sort of say this in this context, but I also <coughs> don't take a pension. Uh, and then to have her flip on it two days before she retired, I thought was appalling. So believe, and I said that, and it was in the IJ, and you can check. Yeah, no, <laughs> actually, that would be really simple. But, but let me sort of take things back for a minute. Let me take the, let me take the conversation to a slightly different level for a minute. The pension issues are, are really important as I've been talking with Bob. The other piece of it though that, that it's important for all of us to keep in mind, and I, you sort of alluded to it Bob by saying you weren't against anybody, are our employees. <coughs> and we are facing as a county the possibility of having a third of our workforce retire within the next five years. You heard a lot of candidates here tonight talk about the lack of affordability and the pressure on everyone who works in this, this community, whether it's county <coughs> or it's private sector, of not being able to live here and having to commute and clogging our roads. There's a real challenge for us, just talking about us as a county employers, and also for our schools in retaining and recruiting people. This is really a significant challenge. A lot of people move here, as we all know, because they like the quality of, the, of our schools. If our schools cannot retain good teachers and they can't recruit good teachers, we're, we have the potential of losing a significant value uh, for our communities. And so there's a lot to criticize with pensions, and particularly some of our big numbers, our big figures, that's what gets all of our attention. But for our average employees, <coughs> it's a very, very different story. And I really want to make sure we all keep that in mind. Because like any business, whether it's public service or it's the private sector, what <coughs> creates the value are the good employees. And we want to make sure that we can keep the best employees so we can provide the best services. And so, I know you so know that. Why don't you take care of the whole thing? Hang on, hang on. 
we need to put a couple more people in here, then we got to wrap this up. I hear a lot of concern about workers from who can't afford to live here, and not a lot about the middle class people who are faced with all the taxes. I hear very little concern about helping them. I'd like to know from the candidates what kind of budget cuts you think we can make, what kind of um, savings that we all, as taxpayers, can. Um, who are paying the salaries of those county people can expect to um, receive. And then finally, the county people have really well-paid jobs. How many of them live in Sonoma County? And maybe we should start hiring Marin people to fill the Marin County <laughs> jobs yeah. so that there's no commute problem and the money stays in Marin. Very good. Good point. Could I just make an observation about that? Sure. I have a question when it gets done. <laughs> And then one last question from him, and then we got to wrap it up. Um, that, that's a terrific question. Um, so the, the ever increasing uh, taxation that is being imposed upon people who live and work in Marin County is becoming oppressive. And yet, we're also realizing the benefits of an improved economy, and that is prompting a variety of different uh, entities throughout the county, including the county itself, but not limited to the county to be looking at opportunities to increase our taxes even more. With sales taxes at the county level, with new bond issues uh, that will be coming out from the community college or for College of Marin, uh, potentially also from the hospital. Um, we need to be very aggressive in, in responding to the uh, relentless pressure to continue to add new taxes onto our bills every year. Uh, we have been, un uh, the, the measure that was put out to, to float the bond for the College of Marin, um, you know, I don't want to say it was dishonest, <laughs> but it, it completely uh, underestimated from the public's <coughs> point of view what they had in mind in terms of the money that they needed to do the projects that they wanted. And many of those projects are not central to its core mission. We need to resist those kinds of efforts that are going on, as I said, not just at places like College of Marin, there's going to be another one, I'm confident, that's going to come out from the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got a sales tax measure that's being proposed uh, at the county. Those aren't necessary. Right now, we've got to put a hold on the increases of taxes so that, frankly, the middle class in this community can catch up. With the level of sure. Um, I'll just make one quick point. Um, he mentioned that UPS is one of the most dangerous professions in the world. Actually, I just just Google my phone in 2015. Mm -hmm. five, UP, five UPS workers were killed. 126 officers died. If you round that number to 100 firefighters, that makes 250. You do it over a 10-year period, over 4,000 people in public safety have died. I guess the question I have for all the members, what would they do to, in some, some sense, encourage or recruit public safety people to work here, making 23 to $30 an hour for a sheriff deputy to prevent them from going over to San Francisco, which is not that far away. Uh, what would they do? Again, I don't feel any obligation to have more people come and live here. All right, well, and just to mention that the average salary of Moranians is $150,000 and the average salary of sheriffs is 57. The, the, um, I was just in a meeting at San Rafael Police mm -hmm. um, working on uh, some safety issues in San Rafael. Uh, there were two officers in the room. They are the only traffic officers presently on duty in San Rafael. Um, we are, you know, we're hearing conflicting things here in the room. Let's cut our taxes. Let's not raise our taxes. Let's not pay people well. Let's not provide housing for people. And at the same time, we want better schools, we want our police officers, we want our firefighters. Mm -hmm. I would actually put it back on you. What is it that you want? What are the things that you feel we don't need anymore that are being provided by the county that we should cut out in order to not have the taxes? All or nothing? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying what, what, what I'm saying, saying is... I don't think you said that. I don't, I don't think, think I said that either. I just post, she posted out there because 75% of fire departments in the United States are volunteers. That's what she posted. Yeah, I, 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 I,
we, we, we spend tens of millions of dollars on consultants every year. Yeah, we have great em employees at Civic Center, smart people. They can they can take on that 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 workload, and we can we can take those funds spent on consultants and put them into 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 services that we need. So are you going to increase the staffing at the county? Absolutely not. No. Okay. Absolutely okay. not. It's overstaffed. Ready then. No, here, here's an example. I, I sit on, on the Central Mid Sanitation Agency Board of Directors, and we were looking at contracts this past year, and they, they, they brought in a proposal for uh, the general manager who makes over $235,000 a year, and they had a proposal to give him a 5% bonus because he did a good job. That passed on that board five to one. I was the one person who said, no, we shouldn't be giving bonuses to our public employees. You know, they, they do a good job. If they do a good job, they keep their job. We don't need bonuses. I mean, there's so many ways that we can cut back on these expenses and be able to afford our firefighters and police officers. General Crouch, you know they're making more in San Francisco, which is probably 50000 60000 more. Do you want to work in San Francisco? Hey, it's, yeah. I live in the Bay Area. I'm just well, I'm just saying. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.